Howdy, it's Mr. Pete 222 again. Sometimes I call myself Tubal Kane. But uh, this is episode number five of my video series entitled What Makes It Work? Be sure and watch the first four. This is number five, and the subject is the centrifugal clutch. Now, there are times when we were boys, we would call these an automatic clutch, but the correct term is centrifugal clutch. So let's take a look at uh, who made it, who invented it, uh, how it works, uh, what its advantages and disadvantages are. This clutch came off of a go-kart and you can tell that a boy owned it because it's, it's beat up and anything again that a boy had, including when I was a boy, is mutilated. But this is a centrifugal clutch with a belt pulley on it and they were also available with uh, sprockets on them. And these are widely used on uh, gasoline engines and the beauty of them is that you do not need any uh, gearbox, you do not need uh, any kind of foot clutch or other types of disengagement because these are not engaged when the engine is at idle or until it comes up to a certain RPM. Then it will slowly engage, it slips to start with and then fully engages and uh, uh, when you decelerate uh, just the opposite happens so they're kind of foolproof. Remember they get very hot from the friction so don't touch them and I learned that in 1960 with my Cushman motor scooter how hot they were. So these are clutches that engage as the engine speeds up and uh, the shoes in here and there's uh, there's almost like brake shoes in here expand by centrifugal force they're held together with a clutch but the centrifugal force causes them to expand and then grip really what amounts to almost a, a brake drum here so in, in some ways it's a little bit uh, of a brake drum and uh, these are pretty unique pretty clever and these were invented by a man in the late 30s and also he claimed that he invented it because uh, his uh, Cushman scooter was not satisfactory so I don't know what kind of, uh, of arrangement they had on it but mine my Cushman had a centrifugal clutch on it but the amazing thing is this Thomas Fogarty uh, was very mechanical I don't know if he held the patent on this or not because I couldn't find anything about the patents on this that related to him but he became a medical doctor and had over a hundred to 150 patents and inventions mainly on surgical instruments of various kinds but the most notable thing that he invented was the balloon catheter the very type that was used on my sister two weeks ago to put a stent in one of her arteries so he must have been an amazing man to have invented everything from something like this to the balloon catheter the interesting thing is that uh, we, we have this all on one shaft rather than uh, a series of shafts. There is a bearing in here that allows this to spin before it gets up to speed. That bearing seldom gets lubricated but it should be lubricated uh, really every couple hours or so. It's usually a bronze type bearing but you don't want to over oil it. You want to get the oil in here not in here on the, the shoes themselves. These were and still are for that matter used commonly on all chainsaws, weed eaters, scooters, uh, go-karts and, and other devices like that. And they come in different sizes. This is a fairly sizable one here and they generally run in the range from fifty to a hundred dollars. But since a dollar is only worth twenty cents these really only cost fifteen dollars. There are several cons or disadvantages to a centrifugal clutch and they are that uh, there is slippage and that's the very uh, way that they operate is to, is to slip but because of the slit we slip we have a lot of heat and inefficiency and they're not a good application uh, or a good uh, clutch for an application where there's very high torque but once they are fully engaged they hold quite well. To demonstrate how this works and to avoid the noise of a gasoline engine I'm in my basement and I have mounted the centrifugal clutch on a three-quarter inch shaft that's in the three-jaw chalk. 
and I have belted it to a load here which is nothing more than a little Boston gearbox and in fact it isn't much of a load I it doesn't impose hardly any load at all I, I need a little more load for but but this will will do and I uh, got enough tension on here and I'm easily able to change the speed on the lathe because I have the variable speed control here so uh, it might be a little loud as I come up to the uh, the full speed that causes it to engage but let's uh, take a look at it here and hopefully it's not too loud where I can't talk over the noise of the machine with the machine turned on and the clutch engaged or that is the lathe clutch I don't want to confuse it you here but the centrifugal clutch at this lower speed and this is only four or five hundred rpm notice that it is not driving at all and that would be uh, simulating the idle but the idle on a gas engine would be much faster so the lathe is now running at 500 rpm and watch the clutch now as I increase the speed and I'm up to a thousand rpm still nothing happening and now I'm approaching 1800 RPM is when it started to engage. I'm at 2000 RPM and it appears to be fully engaged. Now watch as I slow it down. I'm down to about 1500 RPM and it stopped, although it's creeping just a little bit. You notice on a chainsaw or something there's a little bit of creeping at a certain RPM. And there's just a little bit of heat pr produced there. It's not bad, just warming up. But eventually, if there's much slippage, they're going to uh, get very hot. Now, if your clutch ever turns blue, then you're running it at the wrong speed or you're, you're uh, turning your uh, accelerator on and off such that this is uh, constantly engaging and re-engaging. And that, that'll cause it to heat up. So you need to run them where they're fully engaged and uh, then uh, the heat will dissipate. I removed the clutch from the lathe and from the shaft and uh, there's a set screw right here and it's also driven by a key and the idea of putting a set screw right on the shaft and not on the key is not desirable because no doubt it put a, a dimple in there and that's why somebody had trouble getting it off and looks like they beat on it even if you put a puller on here you will deform a sheet metal pulley it should be pulled from back here now I want to take this apart so you can see how it's made and I will need to press it off so I will do that off camera and get right back to you when it is in two pieces here it is in two pieces and it simply presses apart or presses together now this is the brass bushing that I was telling you about and uh, the oil needs to get down in here and on a regular basis because it's going to boil out of there these, these get so hot does that look suspiciously like a brake drum and then here is the clutch material much like uh, a clutch on a car or, or a brake uh, would be made of and the, there's a spring going clear around that's collapsing them holding them, them together and the clutch itself here is in uh, four pieces one two three four segments so that they can expand and when the speed gets great enough which we know now is around 1800 rpm it, it will overcome the uh, uh, pressure of the spring and expand and expand into I'll call this the drum and then by friction it will start to grab that's backwards of course but that's the principle of it and sometimes you'll hear these clutches make a little chiming noise when they're not engaged when you're idling but there has to be a little space there now when that friction material wears out then of course the clutch is shot I suppose those can be replaced and I'm not going to take the spring off to show you those pieces pretty clever 
guess what? I changed my mind. I took the spring off. It wasn't as hard to get off as I thought. And let's take a look at these uh, clutch segments. And there's four of them. And they just look exactly like brake shoe material, don't they? This is old enough to where there's probably asbestos in here. I'm going to put them back exactly the same as I took them out. Not that it probably makes much difference, but you can see that there's a, a, a little lug in here on a swivel that goes into each one of these uh, notches. And that's all there is to this clutch. And that's what they look like reassembled. And you can see there isn't very much space here between the shoe and the drum. Now I'll put it back together. While I got it apart, I was just checking the, the springiness or the stretch. This is a very hard to stretch spring, so it's relatively heavy wire. So that would have to have been a carefully engineered, probably experimentation too, to get it to be just the right tension so that the uh, clutch would engage around 1800 RPM. Now I will proceed to press it back together, which is a simple job, either in a vise or with a press. And uh, remember that there is to be no slippage right here between this hole and here. That's what presses on. The slippage for the bearing is this brass bearing on the tubular shaft. And that's what makes these whole things, these, uh, these clutches, so very compact. And it's really an ingenious idea for a centrifugal clutch and they're still widely used, probably most often in chainsaws. Well, I hope you enjoyed this episode uh, number five of What Makes It Work, and now you know how a centrifugal clutch works. This is Tubal Cain saying so long for now.